All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, bringing back a segment that we haven't had in a while is the Bluetooth breakdown, where we get a call from a very special guest. And today that guest is uh, the fresh-faced uh, individual from the cold front part, um, Clayton Garrett. Uh, he's going to be joining us to talk a little bit about uh, Brian Dable and uh, Josh Allen going into year three and how that's going to impact the free agency for the Buffalo Bills, who have to do it remotely now because of the, you know, the what's going on in, in uh, around the world. Clayton, how you doing this morning, buddy? I'm good. Thanks for having me on, man. Oh, yeah. But it's it's going to be a great time talking a little bit about the, what, Paul? What? We, listen, I, we're going to kick the rust off the tires with that Brian Dable conversation. I know, because <laughs> you've been you've been uh, huddled up in your house taking care of your newborn son. I have been. So you haven't been able to get some of the rage out that I know the frustration <laughs> is, so why not talk about Dable? Like, uh, but like I said, Clayton, I want you to kick it off with, uh, I mean, what are your, unless you, I mean, if you have statistics, you have, what is your expectations of, because we haven't seen this in a while in Buffalo where a coordinator has survived multiple years. We haven't seen a coach survive multiple years. So a uh, head coach, but what, what are your expectations as far as Dave, the Dable Allen relationship going into year three? I mean, last year, we look at, you look at how many resources they allocated that side of the ball. You're talking about millions of dollars of free agency. You're talking about numerous day two draft picks over the course of the last two seasons. You know, there was a lot of resources allocated to that side of the ball. And going into 2019, my expectations were, okay, I think this is going to be a top 20 offense. You know, top 20, that's not world-breaking. That's not an offense where it's, okay, they're light teams up, and this is the reason why the football team's winning. No, obviously the defense is still going to be the backbone of the football team, I think, regardless of whatever uh, resources they allocate this offseason. But obviously it's all very dependent on what moves they make, whether they draft a running back in the first round, draft a receiver in the first round, a tackle, what moves they make in free agency. It's all very contingent of those things, of how you can base your expectations around those things. But the argument that many people made for Brian Dable and keeping him in Buffalo as the offensive coordinator, despite what I would call an overwhelming season. I think that's putting it nicely. You know, it was, it was an underwhelming season. And, you know, really the argument they made was the continuity. The continuity of having an offensive coordinator for the third season in a row with the same quarterback in the same offense. Okay, so now what, what would be the expectation? Really? What, what would we say, okay, you need to be, have this good of an offense or else that's not good enough? I really, I, I'm really at that line of, okay, it needs to be a, a, an offense that places in the top half of the league in either yardage or points, preferably points, because points win games. But, you know, we're talking about an offensive coordinator who didn't even have his best offense as an NFL offensive coordinator last season with the, arguably the best talent he's had in the National Football League. Right, and, and to kind of parlay off that, I think a lot of people were, you know, didn't know the fact that Dable's never had a return gig as an offensive coordinator and made it. <laughs> right. Right? So this was this was uncharted territory for him. Uh, you know, having an offense that kind of evolves over a course of several seasons, this that's new, right? This this isn't this isn't known territory for him. It is it is unknown territory. Um, and I there's I had some concerns and I know um, there there's some people in, in the Buffalo media. I'm I'm just gonna name John Murphy as one of them who is a billion percent the believer that Allen was holding Dable back, right? And I struggle to see that perspective quite a bit, although I know Allen has a lot of opportunity. I struggle to buy into the Allen's the reason the Bills offense, you know, kind of middled the whole season um, mm -hmm. through, through games. Like, it's – I just – I struggle to believe that. Well, one of the things that you can take a look at, and it, it was right in our face all year, was uh, – do, do the wins that the Buffalo Bills got this year, the 10 wins, were that was it masking a lot of the offensive problems that was going on? Because we, we had mentioned a lot of times, listen, they're doing this, they're doing this, they should do this. And Dable runs a system, which is derivative from, you know, it came from New England, 
And it's a, it's a system that not everyone runs. So it's not like if you got rid of him, you're going to bring in someone that could run that system. It's not it's not very – I mean, there's like five or six teams that, that run it right now, and that number is growing because it's the, the system works. But the other thing that I wanted to say was look at, look at what Greg Roman was able to do in Baltimore. He said, listen, right. all right, I have this offense, but – it's it's tailor made for for Lamar Jackson, okay? It's I'm going to take his strengths and I'm going to put this offense in. I'm going to do all this. the The offense that Dable's trying to run isn't necessarily ta- tailored toward all of Allen's strengths right. and how he Agreed. was able to perform. So there's going to be some growing pains in this offense. He's got Allen has to change some things up. I don't know if Murphy that was Murphy's point was that he was holding. Well, Dable's like I know this system works. And Allen's like, okay, I still have to learn it. But you had, not, you know, you had all these new pieces on the offense. It wasn't going to come together overnight, and I knew that. Well, and I, and Clayton, I guess this question comes to you. So when you're talking about adding to that Bills offense, we saw the Bills add veteran players to the wide receiver position, Brown and Beasley, both who have never run the system before. Yeah. Right. So it was kind of new to right. them as well. So you have to accept, uh, you know, accept some maturation there. Does adding a rookie receiver fix anything for you? Actually, honestly, that that's kind of where I was going with it, is I don't think adding a rookie receiver in the first round. I mean, I think personally with as deep as this class is, I think you're better off drafting two of them, on neither of them, on the first day of the draft. I think your best route is adding somebody who's been in the league, who has performed in the league, who's been around and doesn't have to allocate to an entire new game almost, essentially, because you're going from playing amateur football to playing professional football. Okay, the Bills, they... They need help now. They need a player that can be a playmaker now. They need somebody that can walk up that door. Okay, let's learn the playbook. Let's learn. Let's learn how to catch passes from Josh Allen, and that's it. You don't have to learn a new city. You don't have to learn a new job. Learn a new schedule. All the things that go with that being allocated from a college game to the professional game. You know, until the rumors were going around that AJ Green was going to get tagged, I was all on board for signing AJ Green. But I'm still all on board of targeting a free agency rather not not to the extent of Mari of Amari Cooper, where you're paying a guy almost twenty million dollars. Well, but I'm still crazy. in favor of signing a free agent wide receiver rather than drafting one in the first round of the draft. Okay, so you're – and I, I'm going to make a hockey reference here. So you're equating drafting a receiver to drafting a goalie. When you draft a goalie in the NHL draft, you're like, okay, well, listen, we know this is going to take a little bit of time, <laughs> right? It's just true. You draft a first-round goalie, <laughs> homeboy's not playing. Like, he's go, he's not playing. Um, but in, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you, and we've talked about it before. There's, there's a big learning curve to understanding a route tree. And stop me if you've heard this before, but the Bills are target, quote unquote, big finger quotes, T. Higgins from Clemson. And stop me if you've heard this before, a Clemson wide receiver who admits he's never run a full route tree. I don't know if I'm willing to make that investment. Again. Right? I, again. again. I'm not, I can't say I'm willing to again. do that. <laughs> yeah, I can't say I'm willing to do that. Hashtag 2014. Yeah, like, I don't, no, want, I don't, to do I don't want to do that again. All right, so let you me... know, I, I mean, I'm not really a superstitious person, but I, I, I'm, just staying around. <laughs> I'm just staying away from Clemson players in the first round. Oh, God, Clayton, point. you and I share a brain. I swear to God, we share a brain. Um, <laughs> so if if I, I'm going to float one name past you, because you mentioned free agent wide receivers as being an option, right? I'm going to float one name. It's the name I'm dreading the most, right? Uh, uh, don't do it. No, I already know who you're going to tell. Well, who am I going to say? I know who you're going to ask. Go ahead. Don't say it. Say it. Clayton? Yes or no, Devin Funches. That was it. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> no. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. That's Pers- personally, I think a name that, that, I mean, not a lot of people are talking about that we really have to keep an eye out for would be Tajay Sharp. I, I mean, look like at Tajay You see a player who had really good production his rookie season in 2016, and then in 2017, not only did they draft Corey Davis, but he also got hurt. And ever since then, he was buried in that offense. So he never really got an opportunity to flourish. I mean, let alone he had Marcus Mariota as his quarterback. But I think if he were added to the bill, you're talking about a player with decent size, with decent catch radius, with decent explosiveness. I think he would be almost a perfect complement to John Brown. I mean, I, I understand an argument for Devin Punches if the value were there. But to be quite honest, my second option, if it weren't Tajay Sharp, it would be the Marcus Robinson. Marcus mm-hmm. Robinson, you're looking at a player who had a similar situation to Tajay Sharp, but not to that extent, whereas he had an MVP quarterback and not Marcus Mariota and Ryan Tannehill playing back there. So Demarcus Marcus Robinson, you're talking about a player that kind of has the same skill set as John Brown, so I'm not as in favor of Demarcus Robinson, but I can certainly understand it. Understand it. 
But when we were talking about adding a receiver at the trade deadline in the middle of the season, you know, we were really talking about adding that number one threat, adding an A.J. Green, adding a Stephon Diggs. And really, I wasn't in favor of adding a player, whereas you would really have two number twos. And I feel you like you're getting more so of that with Demarcus Robinson. And I'm not saying that Tajay Sharp is your wide receiver one. I just feel like he would be a much a far better complement to John Brown than Demarcus Robinson. Yeah, and I always come back to the fact of what type of offensive system are you running? Like, if you put if you put Corey Davis on the L.A. Rams, I think he's a stud. Well, yeah, he's, you know Rob, I mean? he's Robert Woods 2.0. Yeah, yeah, that's what I think you have. But the fact that he's in Tennessee, that has to go to the system that you're able to run. And, all right, is, is he a good downfield blocker? You know, right. you, you had the league's leading rusher this year in Derrick Henry. So, right. um, as far as that goes, what kind of system are you going to be bringing him in? Does a number one in this system – Completely stand out. Well, no, if you got three twos, you seem like you'd be all right. You seem like you'd be okay. You have Beasley in the slot. You have right. Knox. And if you had another receiver of a John Brown uh, caliber opposite of him, in that four-wide set, who are you going to tilt coverage toward? Well, you know what I mean? So and this is also not an offense that's throwing the ball 45 times a game. No, it's not. You know, it's – I. And even the offenses that do throw 45 times a game leverage their running back. Yes, they do. Right, in the passing game. The Bills don't really do that. They do – uh, they've dabbled in it this season, more so than they have in the past, right? They've dabbled in it last season. D- dabbled it? Yeah. D- oh, stop it. <laughs> See, and I, I like your Tajay Sharp. I, I like Tajay Sharp a lot, so I'm glad you brought him up. Um, the one player I'm excited to see hit free agency, there's actually two. Geronimo Allison is one of them. Because I look at Geronimo Allison as just a freak of an athlete, right? But if you couldn't separate yourself in that wide receiver group in Green Bay – like, are you ever going to separate yourself? He had flashes. But... Sorry, we had to do a quick stop. I had to put the mom seatbelt on Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome yeah, back thanks. to the car, Paul. Thanks. Um, the other one is Rashad Higgins from Cleveland. Oh, you, we, this is two years now you've been talking about I Higgins. No, I like Rashad Higgins. I, I don't know if it was just the chemistry between him and Baker Mayfield, but the two of them must have been drinking buddies because they got along great on the field. <laughs> But Higgins struggled to stay on the field last year, you know. Yeah. Uh, so those are the two guys that I'm kind of looking at um, is is Allison and, and Higgins. Um, but, again, well, this is not a great free agency class for wide receivers. Let, let me ask you guys this. If the Bills were to add a receiver of the variety that we're talking about, like Rashad Higgins or Taj A. Sharp, right. someone to not the extent of, oh, well, the Bills got their guy. Well, we're all sitting there saying the Bills got their guy to fill out their wide receiver room and they're set at that position. Are you satisfied if they were to just add a Rashad Higgins, a Tajay Sharp, a Demarcus Robinson, a player of that variety? Are you satisfied with that room going into 2020? No. No. Yeah, no. No, no, no. because what you're going to have is now the business side of it coming in. So if you add him, if you add Sharp, you have to draft. You have to draft mm-hmm. a kid, maybe third, fourth round, so, right. because you got two years left, two more years left on Brown, two more years left on Beasley. Right. You're going to have – Sharp or whoever you sign, you think it's going to be a three-year deal to overlap, and then you're going to draft a guy who's at minimum a four-year year deal. Right. So you're going to overlap all those guys. And, and you know, not to say that they can't go out and free agency next year and get another guy, but you have to overlap some of these deals with both age and you know the player that you have. Right. I think you got to do that. Right. If they just go and get one guy in free agency and they don't draft anybody. I think it's be, it's going to be worrisome for next year. Well, I think that that strikes me as Doug Whaley's, you know, we thought the wide receiver room was set. Or Brandon Bean's first year, we thought the wide receiver room was set. And that's what happened. We saw them make no moves at wide receiver. We ended up with Kelvin Benjamin and, uh, you know, just, just a collection of the same guys we had the year before. Mm. And I think it's kind of lost in the dialogue that adding Brown and Beasley at the same time was incidental. Right, yeah. we had them both on the phone at the same time. They both agreed to sign, and they said, "Well, what are we going to do?" Well, let's just get both of them. Right? It was incidental. So the fact that their contracts line up was just them mitigating risk. Right? That's really what that is. And that wide receiver room is ripe to reset soon. So you do kind of have to start looking at those long-term investments there, because the you know at best case scenario of Duke Williams for another three seasons. But I'm sorry, I'm not a big fan of a guy who only catches, you know, fifty percent of the balls thrown to him. Like, that's just, I, that's me in, in the litmus test that it's been, that's me. But um, I, we've, and we've seen this from Bean before, and we've talked about it. Oftentimes, those early free agent signings get doubled down in the draft. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You look at Croft. Croft was doubled down with Knox and Sweeney. You look at, um, you know, re-signing Jordan Phillips. You still drafted at Oliver. You know, mm-hmm. um, you you look at uh, what was the, oh Tyler or not Tyler Croft? What was the other one we just talked about? Oliver. No, I just talked about Oliver. Singletary. Singletary. Yeah, you signed Yeldon. Yep. You still double down and get Singletary, even though you already had McCoy, McCoy, McCoy and McGore. You had McGore. Drink your coffee. I know. <laughs> you, already, you already had McCoy and Gore, who was also a free agent signing. So, yeah, it, I'm I'm 100% on board with you. Um, it, it it seems to be the pattern that just because you sign him in free agency doesn't mean that position's done. Uh, the, the Bills right. are, are ripe to draft. So what would be your ideal Doc. scenario, Clayton? An ideal scenario? Yeah. For me personally, with how bad T. Higgins' pro day went, the the slow 40, the low vertical, I, I see a lot of potential with T. Higgins, but I don't see the potential being at 22. I don't see you maximizing the value of drafting him in the first round anywhere, not even at the 32nd pick. Personally, it'd be very intriguing, intriguing to me to see them sign Demarcus Robinson and then draft T. Higgins in the second round. Because... With T. Higgins in the second round, I could see a scenario that – now, I'm not going to say he's going to end up like Zay Jones, but I can see a scenario similar to how it ended up with Zay Jones. You know, different players, different questions, same result. They both fall into the second round. I see if T. Higgins falls out of the first ten picks, or maybe not even that low. He falls out of the first five picks of the second round. I wouldn't be shocked to see Brandon Bean trade up and draft T. Higgins in the second round after acquiring Demarcus Robinson in free agency. And I think that would be a really ideal scenario. I mean, you're talking about – a wide receiver room consisting of Demarcus Robinson, John Brown, T. Higgins, and Cole Beasley. I think that that that's a really good room, and you're setting your your quarterback up in a position to succeed with that room. That is a lot of speed, and that's a lot of and, and, and being the fact that it wouldn't be a first round pick; it would be a second round pick. Uh, the pressure of the kid, what you're going to be asking him to do, right? Yeah, and and right. the, and the trade up scenario. You know, I'm still not a part. I'm still not a believer that Bean is going to sit there and wait. Uh, until his pick is called on draft day. I, I don't believe that Bean is going to sit there on draft day. When they find players that they like, they just go get them once they feel that they're in the value structure that, that, that they're willing to give up. So I, 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 I just don't see the Bills actually taking the pick at 22. No, no, they're going to do something. They got two fifths and three sixths, and because of that, they love moving around. I think it's two fifths and three sixths, right? Uh, that sounds right. Okay, but Bean loves to, and you're going to have teams that are going to have cap troubles, even going up to the draft, even with the the recent scenario of what's going on in the league, uh, basically things getting shut down. Um, you're going to have teams that are not going to be able to move certain players that they want to move. Um, so they're going to want picks, which is the cheapest resource to get bodies in camp. So I can see Bean just bundling up, you know, a few picks here and there. They got nine picks. I predict six. Paul predicts seven that they're actually going to take uh, on draft day. But, um, yeah, the, the wide receiver room is, is, is so intriguing going into this offseason and how what, – what are you going to – what elements mix together help this offense? Because you're going to have a, a guy that comes in. You had John Brown who played for Bruce, Bruce Arians and says that this is the most complicated offense he's ever, he's ever right. been in. So well, and one of the I think one of the concerns that you have when when you start talking about deep wide receiver classes, oh, this is a deep wide receiver class, is we heard the same jargon about the you know the the Darnold draft about quarterbacks. Well, like oh yeah, this is a deep this is a deep quarterback draft. Yeah, sure, but do you want to draft Josh Rosen in the first round? Oh, the answer to that is no. So <clears throat> with sitting where the Bills are, <laughs> do you want to draft Josh Rosen at wide receiver? Like, do you want to draft the Josh Rosen of wide receivers? No, they, you don't. They but, drafted the Josh Rosen of corners in 2017. He was the fourth corner off the board. Well, they did, yeah. Yeah, when they grabbed him. But Trey. I think that just goes to the how they evaluate talent better than anything else. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're like, hey, we got to get up with Tampa Bay to get Allen well, That's why we're this not getting Rosen. Cancellation of pro days, I'm just not that concerned about it right now. You know, it's this, because of their track record. Yeah, right? their track record's proven to me that that I'm willing to trust their front office through this process. You know, with the with the cancellation of pro days, um, I'm kind of on board with you. I'm not really concerned about it. It's unfortunate for the more hybrid prospects, the prospects that have far more questions surrounding them. When we're talking about prospects that are certified, that are bonafide, going to be drafted in the first two days of the draft, I'm not necessarily concerned about those players. I'm not necessarily concerned about the players because, you know, we know this front office does their homework. We know this front office has done their due diligence on most of the draft. Obviously, the board is nowhere near set yet, and it shouldn't be by any means. 
Right. But I, I, I kind of have a hybrid question. You guys are both kind of in favor that you, you can kind of see them moving up in the first round. Now, and I want to give you guys a scenario. If the Bills were to fill a majority of their holes in free agency or trade, if they were to fill the biggest holes on their team, like wide receiver, like edge rusher, how would you guys feel if they were to stay pat or even trade back in the first round and draft a running back in the first round? They, they're, even though they do have to spend a lot, they're cash spend. They do have to spend a lot of a lot of money in this offseason. They do have to fill their. Uh, they do have a lot of cap room. I don't know if drafting a running back in the first round at twenty two would would be would be ideal that you have Singletary now. You know what I mean? I think Singletary has proven that he could be your workhorse back there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm. They'd have to fill a lot of holes before. You know, kind of to circle this back to something that you mentioned really early, talking about Dable and that continuity, is right. So sometimes I think continuity is just an excuse to accept your mistakes of the past, right? So, like, yep. you look at Dable, you're like, well, it's the best we've had so far, I kind of guess, right? And we've had seasons <laughs> where we've had really great running backs on the roster at the same time, and yet we weren't able to leverage those in seasons past, right? So I don't want to state that investing another high pick in a running back is something I'm comfortable with because if I look at what's happened in the past, I don't see Dable having a history of using two running back sets uh, effectively. I mean, I'm looking at another season of Frank DeMarco, right? That's what I'm staring at in the face. Why do you always say Frank DeMarco? I'm, yeah, God, it's, I do always say Frank DeMarco. You who put them I, together. I don't even know right. who that is. <laughs> That's my accountant, Frank DeMarco. <laughs> Patrick DeMarco. I, you look, I'm looking at another season of Patrick DeMarco, and I don't think drafting another running back is going to stave him being off the field, right? So I, to right. me, I, I do look at it as saying I don't see a history of this organization leveraging those, but that's not really as important as saying I don't see a history of Dable using two backs effectively. I know he uses them a lot, but I, I don't see a history of him using two backs effectively mm-hmm. um, enough to where it would be worth the investment for two defensive-minded coaches and McDermott and Leslie Frazier saying, yeah, let's draft a running back. So to me, I just don't yeah. think I don't think there's enough writing on the wall for that. I, I I can see where you're coming from with that. The the whole history of Dable using two backs effectively, but that kind of, that's kind of a testament to your offensive coordinator limiting your personnel decisions, is it not? Yeah, yeah. That that's more so a testament of oh well maybe maybe we should have gotten a different one. Maybe we should have hired somebody and not favored in continuity and whatnot, but. Honest to goodness, I'm not I'm not a player, or excuse me, not a player, not a person that's typically in favor of investing up, uh, high resources or important resources into running backs, paying them, dra- drafting them high. But if we are talking about come draft day, where the Bills fill the hole of edge rusher with say Genevieve Clowney, say they sign Genevieve Clowney, mm-hmm. say they say they find a receiver one way, shape, or form, and they manage to trade for AJ Green, and they and they restructure his deal and give him a fair deal so that it's a good cap number. And both sides are happy. Say this, this is the scenario that we're, we're sitting in on draft day. I wouldn't be shocked at 22, or even if I said, or like I said, if they had traded back and they draft J.K. Dobbins. Because here's the interesting thing of complimenting Singletary. He's a player that is multifaceted, is multidimensional. He can run between the tackles, but he's not limited when running off the edge like a Frank Gore, like we saw last season. He's not limited when it comes time to run off tackle. But he's also scrappy enough to get the one or two yards that you need in short charge situations. So you can you're really looking at a player in a room that you can choose to compliment Devin Singletary. However, take your pick. You can either pick a you can either take a power back. You can sign a power back, a guy that can run between the tackles and fight for yards like a Frank Gore, or you can take an explosive guy. Get a guy get a guy with more potency. Get a guy that has more breakaway speed, more explosiveness, more agility. And honestly. I'm kind of in favor of that side of things because this is an offense that lacks potency, that lacks that explosiveness. And if you add a player like J.K. Dobbins, and then you trade up in the second round and draft a player like T. Higgins after adding all sorts of players on your offense, you're talking about a completely different offense with a completely different look, with a completely different expectation from 2019 to 2020. Well, and and I would hate to be the guy in the media that said draft a running back in the deepest wide receiver class we've seen in <laughs> – in six years. So uh, I'm not going to put my head on that stake. I promise you that. <laughs> that's, that's, but I mean, it's, it's interesting. Like 
all of the scenarios combined that you had, it's like it's like the planets aligning, you yeah. know, perfectly. Okay, you got green, you got this, you got that, and, and you, you checked a lot of those boxes. Um, is is it a possibility that that those things could happen? And having having uh, having like a Dobbins would be, I mean, a, a great compliment to Singletary. It's like who do you who do you cover after that? But I think the greatest thing about your scenario that I that the one thing I liked about it is that every it seems like every excuse gets taken off the table now mm-hmm. for Dable. Exactly. You have zero excuses now for production. You have to produce now. Yep. He's right. I, I mean, you can even make the argument last year that there weren't any excuses because you look at the additions you made. Yes, you have a raw tight end in Dawson Knox. Yes, you have I, I, you have a broken piece with Tyler Cross, and yes, you have a player that kind of playing out of position with Cody Ford. But you're talking about a team that invested a second-round pick in Cody Ford, a third-round pick in Devin Singletary, a third-round pick in Dawson Knox. And then you sign Cole Beasley to a big deal. You sign Mitch Morris to a big deal. You sign Quentin Spain. You sign John Feliciano. Yes, you have nine new starters on that side of the ball. But come week 10, 12, 11, even the playoff game, that, that, that whole point of, oh, nine of 11 new stars, that's no longer an excuse. These guys are professionals. Yes, they were strangers last May, but here we are in December and we're still making the excuse of, oh, there's 9 of 11 new starters. Okay, that, that is an excuse. I don't care what people say. That, that, that is an excuse of these guys aren't really getting to work together. Okay, well, if they're not really working well together, then who does that, whose shoulder does that fall on? Because we're, no long, we're not in the first month or the second month of the season. We're in the playoffs. This isn't an excuse anymore. That's not, a, that, that's not an adequate reasoning for why the offense, for lack of a better term, sucks. Well, I think that puts us at time, sir. Yeah, <laughs> I think it puts us at time. Um, yeah. So, I, but long story short, like when we unpack everything on the offensive side of the football, uh, they, it, the the fact of the matter is whether you like it or not, Dable's still your coordinator, right? Mm-hmm. And I think a lot mm-hmm. of the questions really do become. And I thought you brought up a great point that um, you know it, it's about determining where you're going to be, uh, making sure your your rooms are set. This year, next year, and the following. If Bean has done nothing, he's doing the best he can to set his team up for the future, and that's a position I can't say that we've been in as fans, um, you know, right. before. And I'm excited about it. I have no idea what they're going to do, and that that just makes me so happy to have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to be great. So, um, so like like we said, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for uh, the. Uh, Bluetooth breakdown. We brought this segment back after a while. Uh, um, Garrett Clayton, uh, lucky uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have his services. If you want to go check him out, check out the Cold Front Report on Twitter and Facebook. They have great content. Their articles going up. They're talking about the free agency period. Uh, it's a it's a great time. Uh, we got Jeremy and who else is over there? I, I can't remember. Frank Kilmartin. There's, there's all sorts of people behind the scenes. The people on camera are me, Frank Kilmartin, and uh, Jeremy Perry Montgomery. Nice. But, uh, yeah, go ahead and give us a follow everywhere. I mean, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. It's at Cole for Report underscore Bills News on Instagram. And like, like Mario had said, it's Cole for, at Cole for Report on Twitter and Cole for Report Cole and Buffalo Bills News on Facebook. We always have engaging content. We always, we're always asking the opinions of fans. Obviously, we talk about our opinions amongst each, each other every single day. I mean, it's, it's rare that we go an hour without having some sort of argument or discussion <laughs> about what move or not to move or what other teams are doing and whatnot. But, I mean, it's really about the fans. We really care about what the fans think, what the fans want to do. What the, You know, if the Bills made a bad move, if they want Brian Dable, if they don't want Brian Dable, that, that, that's what we're here for is to hear what the fans think. I love it. I love it. it works. All right, so go, go give them a follow, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take it easy. Clayton, thank you for giving us your time today, and we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. All right, take it easy, bud.